Um, no, I'm kidding. I know Tony very well. He's uh, he's my boss, actually. Uh, he's uh, an associate at BMT WBM and now national practice leader for water quality. So please welcome Tony. I have some confessions to make. First of all, I have to work with Brad. No, um, <laughs> but, um, I, I do have some confessions. Uh, first of all, uh, the term squids. The term squids, I think, was actually uh, coined by uh, the late Nev Gibson in Brisbane City Council, and uh, we were very keen to see that propagate around Australia, and I'm proud to say that it has actually done that now, and we've got people from Adelaide and, and all over Australia, and even in New Zealand, I think, they use the term squids, so it's nice to see. The other confessions I have to make are that um, I've been contracted by uh, legal firms to uh, undertake reviews of systems uh, and uh, the, that's been on, pro on behalf of proprietors. Uh, that's been for Stormwater 360, uh, contracted Clay Newts who asked me to do a review of three systems, so I'll declare that. I've also reviewed uh, data on a peer review basis for Humes, uh, currently in a process with Gold Coast City Council and uh, Sean Leinster uh, and Design Flow to look at uh, proprietary device performance cr uh, criteria. Uh, and um, the st uh, music modelling guidelines uh, that were put up there, that those uh, words were written by Sean Leinster and myself. Um, so that's my confessions. Um, <laughs> I will also confess that I tried to get Shawnee up here to present instead of me because I was here last month and even last month I tried to give it to Al and he wanted to share it, so um, <laughs> I'm really sorry for that. How do we compare like for like? Really, you know, this process about trying to understand how proprietary and non-proprietary devices work, we've been battling with this since I started in, in the squids part of the industry in 1998. In 1998, Brisbane City Council commenced a $2 million a year monitoring program of squids. $2 million per year we invested in actually going out and undertaking that monitoring. And we collected that data. And we wanted to publish that data. But when we got to the publishing point, we met resistance from the industry. Back in uh, 2000, I think, or 1999, the CRC for catchment hydrology, uh, of which I was part of, developed a national testing protocol. That national testing protocol was brought together where we all sat around in a room. Uh, we had a forum where we presented what we thought was required and what we were currently doing. Again, when that protocol came up for publishing, it was rejected by the industry. We have had monitoring reports, the example of Sydney Water, New South Wales EPA, um, other uh, Melbourne Water have all tried to publish independent data on the performance of systems to try and get a level playing field. Time after time after time, the industry has resisted those efforts. The best thing we can do today is get the industry sitting here together and talking. I'll talk a little bit at the end about where we need to go from this point. But if we're going to have this level playing field, we've got to understand that there are many types of devices and they operate in many different ways. Some are physical processes, some are secondary processes, some are tertiary processes. Each one will need to be evaluated in a different way, but it needs to be done using the same protocol. There are multiple parameters, and it was really great that Gerger and others have brought up the issue of cost and maintenance. That is a parameter, as long, uh, along with TSS and TN and TP. But we've also got oils and greases. We've also got organic matter. What's the point of having a, a, a gross pollutant trap if 90% of it is trapping leaves? Is that, is that an appropriate use of a proprietary system? If we had the data to actually say, well, if you stick a device in here where you've got some trees of this, this nature, you're likely to just trap leaves, is that actually a good environmental outcome? We don't know because we don't have a standard protocol to do it. 
We've got different monitoring practices and we need to establish some standards about what those should actually be. If you're going out in the field, don't just think you can grab a few samples and hope for the best. It ain't going to work. If you're going to do field sampling, it needs to be a proper program. If you're going to actually do lab testing, then the lab testing needs to be some reflection of what's going to happen in real world. Synthetic pollutants do not cut it. It's, that's the way it is. And if you're going to do some experimental work, um, such as field experiments like we've done for vegetated swales and bioretention systems, make sure it's a defensible, scientifically robust monitoring method. The number of, of assessments that I've made over the last 20 years where I've seen shortcuts taken left, right and centre. I was a NADA assessor. I know where laboratories take shortcuts. I've seen it and I've pulled them up on it. And I can tell as soon as somebody puts data in front of me where the shortcuts are being made. We've got to be open and honest as an industry to say we're not prepared to do that anymore. We've got to be open, we've got to be honest and say we're prepared to do it the right way. We've got to have protocols that look at wet and dry weather. We've got to have protocols that look at inter-event periods. And non-proprietary uh, systems are just as guilty of this uh, not being done as proprietary systems. I know wetlands that can actually produce more nitrogen than they remove. I've got the monitoring data. Have I been able to publish it? No, because it wasn't scientifically robust enough. But I've certainly seen it occur. We've also got scales of assessment that we need to recognise and take account of. Where some theoretical work has been done, where there's been international data, where there's been real world data, let's have some levels of assessment that account for that and give some recognition to the industry that there has to be a path to market. There has to be a way for them to gradually increase their investment as they're getting cash flow in. These are businesses. These are, are things that have to operate in a commercial world. And we can't say to them, go and spend millions of dollars straight away. We, we just can't. Otherwise, it will never work. We've got to be very clear about how we analyse results. There's a lot of different um, ways of doing this. And as a protocol, we need to establish what we think is the level playing field. We need to make sure we document the operating conditions appropriately so that we can see whether it was a, a level playing field or not. And we have to recognise that there is uncertainty in measurement. No matter where you go, there will be variability. And above all, we need to provide a level of oversight. There needs to be somebody there who takes an independent role to review this. How do we move forward in this? We've got to remember history. Three times I've been involved in developing protocols for assessing uh, proprietary devices. Three times they've been knocked over by the industry when it's come to where the rubber hits the road. We've got to apply real, robust science. Not airy-fairy, I think this is the best way to go. We've got to actually base it on real science. And academia needs to be involved in that process. But above all, we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate as an industry. And as an industry, I mean councils, I mean proprietors, I mean us as consultants. We've got to be transparent, we've got to be honest, and we've got to be prepared to work together. Thank you. Any questions from the audience at all, or from the panel? Tony? I have a question for Tony. Uh, you said it's been knocked over by industry. Like every time you try to develop this protocol, it's been knocked uh, stolen by industry. You can elaborate as to what actually happened. Um, or if you can. Look, uh, the, the issues that I've seen have been based around perceived conflicts of interest. Um, uh, when uh, we were involved with the CRC for catchment hydrology, there were some perceived conflicts of interest between one of the, the parties that was in the CRC uh, because they actually held shares in, in one of the proprietor's companies. So, you know, you've got to say to yourself, well, those stupid idiots should have sold them beforehand, but um, I'm not one to tell that person to do that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so, so there are issues, and, and you know, 
I know today, before I got up here, there's been some argy-bargy about the work that I did for Clayton Noots. And, and, you know, I, that's why I wanted to be open and honest and say, look, people have asked me to do that assessment. But if we're open and honest about it and provide objective advice, what's the issue? I've got Tony, I was really interested to hear about the origin of the squid name because it's actually introduced a lot of debate over the last uh, 12 months. Um, this time last year we were calling it uh, storage and treatment devices, but we didn't think STD was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I've recently had it work to my attention. I haven't checked it out, but someone has actually uh, registered that as a, as a match. You, are you aware of that? No, no, I'm not. Um, look, the, the first time I ever saw it was uh, in Brisbane City Council, we developed some squid design guidelines back in 97. And Nev Gibson uh, and David Simpson, I saw it was in here, um, you know, he was around at that time as well. And we, Andre Taylor and myself, were always big for acronyms. And we saw this stormwater quality improvement device and we shortened it to SQUID and it stayed, uh, it stuck in council and it just seemed to keep going. That, that right, though? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, we're focusing heavily today on proprietary products. Yep. Um, I made the group query before. Are non proprietary products subject to the same testing scrutiny that uh, we are potentially putting these goals on in terms of their proprietary products? Like I'm talking about rain guards, whales, and everything. Do they run the same testing uh, requirements and scrutiny? Um, Look, in terms of compliance, if you looked at, say, the, the music modelling guidelines and said how many of the non-proprietary devices have been through a process of independent peer review, every one. Swales have been, uh, we've had field experiments up here in Pajara Hills, uh, down in, in Melbourne, uh, uh, we've done the field testing, we've looked at international data, it's been published in peer review papers, uh, criticised and, 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 and addressed. Wetlands. Wetlands were assessed by Brisbane City Council, by Gold Coast City Council, um, uh, by the CLC for Catchment Hydrology. Biofilters, the facility for advancing water biofiltration, had three systems under field testing as well as all their laboratory experiments, and all of that was published in independent peer reviewed journals. When we wrote the music modelling guidelines, we looked at that and said if non proprietary devices have gone through this much testing in order to, to justify their, their performance, shouldn't we look at that being applied across the board? Thank you. Any questions? Please well, thank Tony.